Arthur C. Clarke wrote that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I love that quote. I think a lot of sci-fi nerds love that quote because science fiction is filled with things like advanced prosthetics and robotic implants and cybernetic enhancements and brain computer interfaces, you know, like Luke's arm in Star Wars, which they could just tap and it would, it would twitch, it could feel. The Borg in Star Trek, they just had all sorts of things going on. The Matrix being able to just jack in, altered carbon sleeves, black mirror having tapped into your own thoughts and all sorts of crazy stuff. But this ain't magic, it's advanced science. For centuries, we knew that something important was up here in our skulls. We knew it was there. Then finally, in the 1950s, a Canadian neuroscientist named Wilder Penfield tapped into it for the first time. Now, when we stimulated at three, you had a tingling in your thumb. To my astonishment, you said, I hear music. Tell us what you heard. Well, I heard what sounded like an orchestra playing. Would you hum it now? You remember it? Yes. Go ahead. Yes, rolling along together. Yes, that's what it is. <laughs> Penny stimulated that lady's brain with a bit of electricity, and it just seems like magic, right? She was able to hear music, but they didn't play any music. It was her brain playing it to herself, but it was prompted by him. Again, not magic, just physical science. So. Can we upgrade our brains? Oh yeah. And over the next five episodes, we're gonna dive deep into the pool of biology and engineering, psychology, a little bit of ethics, some physics, some neuroscience, of course. And I am gonna talk all about taking a human brain and making it better. Come try ya, humies. Let's kick into it. Hi, 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 hi there, noodlers. I am Trace, and thank you so much for tuning into my channel. Every few weeks, I create a series of videos all about one topic, and I break it down so that everybody understands it, including myself. This series is about upgrading our brains, so make sure you subscribe for all of the episodes. There are five of them. They will also be in a playlist after the series has aired, and they air every other weekday. Almost every other human being comes with a standard set of hardware and software. There are some variations, but when you get a fresh human, like out of the box, yeah, that fresh human smell. Actually, a fresh human smells really nice. Um, there is no manual. There's no operating instructions. It's run by this secretive mass of tissue hidden inside a rigid bone box that you can't get to. But let's say that you wanted to get in there. You want to upgrade that wetware, flash a new BIOS, add a few IO systems, upgrade the whole thing, you know? First step, cracking that skull open, tap the source. This is a rat, probably knew that. This is a human, also probably knew that. And that is a human wagging the tail of a rat. Yeah, that really happened, that really happened. Humans do not have tails. I mean, furries, yes, but you know, not all humans have tails. But with brain computer interfaces, brains can actually speak directly to a computer and then that computer can speak to maybe another computer and then that computer can speak to a rat's brain causing the tail to wag. Doing something like this requires a BCI or BMI, a brain computer interface or brain machine interface. The brain is an extremely sensitive organ. You can mess it up pretty easily. It, it's, it's in there and it's hidden away from the world for a reason. So you have to figure out how to get in there safely, tap into what's going on and understand the chatter. This is what a brain computer interface or brain machine interface does. The internet is a network, so think of it this way. You got a computer on one end and then a computer on the other end and the internet is in the middle. In this case, you have a brain on one end and you have a brain on the other end and you've got a network in the middle as well. Let's do some brain basics, a little review. Brains contain lots of different cells that we call brain cells because we're not that original. They're also called neurons. 100 billion neurons exist in the human brain and they have 100 trillion connections to other neurons. Also within the brain are 300 billion glial cells. Glial is Greek for glue, so it's like a sober friend at the bar. The glials support the neurons physically, chemically, emotionally, I would guess. If you want to crack the puzzle, you need to get an engineer in here. So I called one. Liesl Richardson, that's my name. I am a PhD student at the University of Central Florida. I study neuromechanics and biomechanics in my lab and I absolutely love our brain. I mean, I'm sure you've seen Stranger Things. If anyone has seen Stranger Things, we, we remember Eleven wearing this like really bulky EEG system and all the spikes happening on the piece of paper. 
that's that's like the crudest form of EEG that existed. But it started there because we wanted to kind of understand how our brain works and what the language was. As you know, our brain is it, it's separated into different lobes and cortices that are responsible for different things and, and processing different kinds of information. So this has to do with motor control. This has to do with processing and planning. This is sensory input, that sort of thing. In the 19th century, Italian Luigi Galvani realized that bodies, bodies like ours, run on electricity. Muscles twitch, brains think, hearts beat, and all of that is powered by power. He touched the muscle of one frog to another, and the second one twitched. He realized bioelectricity was really the basis of everything that we do. And that is so convenient because computers, great, also run on electricity. But in the brain, we discovered that it all comes down to this one little cell the neuron. The neuron is the basic component of the brain, and it's what's responsible for knowing when something is activated or not. Hello, my name is Dr. Jessica Chen. I am a neuroscientist, and I'm studying regenerative therapies for spinal cord injury. The neuron itself doesn't do anything in isolation. It needs to be able to talk to other neurons and to think with other neurons. And so when a neuron talks to another neuron, it uses what's called a synapse. So the body of the neuron would send information through the axon of the neuron, which would then go to the dendrites, which are basically the outputs that then go and talk to another neuron. And so when you have all these different neurons that are next to each other and they're creating synapses or points of contact between each other, you have a network. The brain is like this huge complex network of neurons and synapses with all these different areas talking to each other. We need to hack into that network and then we use that information to upgrade the brain. To hack into a network like this, we need to be monitoring the traffic on the network. That means we need to be monitoring what's happening in the network of neurons running through our brains and bodies. And there are six different tools to do that. There's EEGs, MEGs, ECOGs, fMRIs, NIRSs, and intracortical neuron recording. That is six different types. Two of those are invasive, four are non-invasive. Two are indirect, four are direct. All have the same goal though, and that is to understand the three pound, one and a half kilogram mass of tofu-like tissue inside of our skull boxes. So let's break them down. They measure on a few different dimensions, and it's about how they suck up the info and the resolution that they can produce over a period of time. So first, the two indirect ones. There's the fMRI, which is a functional magnetic resonance imager. You hear this all the time in brain studies. We talk about it all the time in science communication. fMRIs measure metabolic interactions. That is blood flow. It's an indirect access because it's not actually seeing what the neurons are saying. It's seeing where the brain is sending resources. And it can see it down to about a one millimeter resolution and it can see activity over about one second. It measures electromagnetic fields produced by blood inside of your brain. And it has some problems that even though it has a low time resolution of only one second, it has very very high space resolution of down to a millimeter. Now, we can't use fMRI to control a computer. It's a little too slow. We have to use a really big machine in order to make it work, but it's a really good study tool. There's near infrared spectroscopy or NIRS, and that's again metabolic. It's an indirect measure and it has a five millimeter resolution over about one second. Five millimeter, a little wider, but it is more portable. It doesn't require as huge a machine like fMRI does. And what it does is it uses IR light to detect blood moving through your brain box. The infrared light can only penetrate about one to three centimeters into the head, but it does do a good job. So you can, you know, do some things with this. It's a little slow and hair can cause issues as can movement, but that's not unusual. Let's move on to the direct methods. The main one that you're gonna hear about is the EEG, electroencephalography. It's electrical, it's non-invasive, it is direct, and it is a 10 millimeter resolution of 0.5 seconds. So really wide view and really quick. The cap that you see in the movies. I'm gonna read your thoughts. That, you know, that measures brain waves. It's general activity outside the skull and it sits on the scalp. So it's not very precise. It can be messed up by blinks, by muscle contractions, any movement, the wires themselves hitting things or jaws being clenched. Literally eye twitches can mess up an EEG. A lot of these things get picked up by EEG. It's very hard to, to 
find the signal. But the really good thing is in the past like two decades, researchers have gotten really good about the algorithms that they use to isolate what they want to find in one particular brain area. But we'll come back to that later. The next one on the list is magnetoencephalography. That is magnetic version of electroencephalography. It's non-invasive, it's direct. It has a five millimeter resolution down to 0.5 seconds as well. It's very similar to EEG. It senses the same patterns and it's a little more precise. It senses the magnetic fields of EM activity in your brain, but you need magnetically shielded rooms, super cooling and a very expensive equipment to make this work. So there's also electrocorticography or ECOG. This one is really cool. It's electrical. It is invasive, which means you have to implant it into your body. It is directly measuring at one millimeter of resolution in 0.3 seconds really, really fast. You have to put electrodes literally on the brain. They have great resolution inside of the brain, but they're more risky because you have to let somebody inject a giant sensor into your brain box directly. It's literally stuck on there. It requires opening the skull, and it's usually what you see in freaky sci-fi movies when they got wires coming out of an exposed brain. You have to stick an array in or on the brain. There's also intracortical neuron recording. It doesn't have a fancy name like the other one. So ICNR, neurocapture. What do you think? We can call it that. Anyway, neurocapture or intracortical neuron recording is direct. It's invasive, which means you have to get inside the head and it has a resolution of 0.5 millimeters to 0.05 millimeters and 0.003 seconds. It is so fast and can see such a small area. It's obviously the best in terms of resolution and time but it's literally touching the brain. There are a bunch of different ways to do that. There are multi-electrode arrays, Michigan probes, Utah intracortical electrode arrays, which are very popular, and they can measure individual groups of neurons, which is excellent for BCIs, but like, yikes a -roo for people who do not want to have their skull opened up. Oh, wild penny may have learned a lot cracking skulls open and poking brains with electrified sticks, but the brain is a living piece of a human body, which means it's constantly moving, constantly reacting to what's going on inside the person's literal head. And it also has a major issue, the signal to noise ratio. The noise could be a hum in the background, and if it's low, then it's fine. You can probably still hear what I'm saying, but if the noise gets to be a little too much, it can actually overwhelm the signal, and then the thing that you're looking for will get lost, and it's crazy that the thing, the <clears throat> It's a thing in the brain too. Yeah, there's there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise from other areas of the brain because our brain is constantly processing from different inputs. An example is if I am a participant in an experiment and there's some kind of visual and auditory cue that I need to look out for and I have to walk at the same time, those are three different senses that our brain is processing at the same time. So that means there are three areas of the brain that are being loud in that moment. I know I'm going on and on about it, but there's like so much to just reading EEG data. It's crazy. Right now, one of the best ways to tap into a human brain is with an electrode called a Utah array. It looks like this, and it's got the least noise and the cleanest signal, but it does require cutting open the scalp, getting into the skull, and implanting it directly on the surface of your brain organ. That's some serious brain surgery and it cannot stay in there forever. Your body will still develop scar tissue around it. The brain can move and it's very plastic. So cells might move around. But if you wanna upgrade, you know, like my girl Beyonce says, right now you're gonna need something like this. For example, let's say we wanted a robot arm that I could control that could catch a ball. There's a lot that goes into that. You gotta see the ball, you gotta calculate a trajectory, you have to move your arm in front of the ball, you gotta anticipate where the ball is gonna be, you gotta move your fingers around it, and since we're talking about a robot arm, I can't crush it with my robot arm. But for that, we need to know not just that the brain is talking and what the brain is saying, we need to speak brain. And I need to know if I've caught the ball, which means we need to write back to the brain. So for that, you're gonna have to come back on Wednesday. Congrats to Dr. Chen, by the way. She just defended her thesis at the University of Michigan. She became a doctor for the first time. So exciting. That's gonna be weird. This is the first time I'm gonna refer to myself as doctor. <laughs> I, I wondered, I was really excited about it. But anyway, thanks again for tuning into this episode of Una Dose of Trace. Now you know how the brain is read from. Next time, how the brain is written to. So I'll see you in the future.